So my Millwright milling machine, which is the perfect kind of shop size mill for a home shop, it's like a three quarter size bridge port. It had a lot of growling noise coming from the spindle. I also noticed the spindle run out was about five thousandths at the cutter end, and that's that's a lot, so I figured if it was that bad, I didn't have much to lose by tearing into the head. The first thing I did was make up a tool to remove the left-hand threaded nut at the base of the spindle. Uh, the pins are, I think, two inches and 450 thousandths apart by my measurement, and the holes are a quarter of an inch. You might hear that if you want to remove the drawbar on a milling machine, you can just lift it out. That actually works on a bridge port, but on a millwright, at least the one I have, the drawbar is designed to pull the collet in, but also push it out again. So the cap has, it's, it's like a captured nut in there. You have to unscrew the whole thing off of the top of the spindle. My machine has a brown and sharp number nine taper. That's a little more uncommon uh, than R8, but I'm fine with it. You could make the case that BS9 is outdated and the machine is less desirable because of that, but I don't see any issue with it. I've found plenty of tooling on eBay and you can buy these collet sets new. Once you have those collet sets, you don't really need much else. In the back of the spindle, there's a plug and when you take that out, you can access the set screw for the preload nut. There's advice in the manual that says, oh, this is where you're supposed to lubricate the bearings. You're supposed to squirt a little bit of grease in there. But uh, if I just stop the video right here where you can see all of that over the years of squirting grease in there, it just sits up there on top of the bearings. And I just don't see how that's a very effective way of getting lubricants down into the bearing races. So you can make up your own conclusions about the best way to you know keep the bearings lasting as long as you can but i think just very carefully lubricating them with high quality grease like the kluber grease um that's probably the best way to keep them going but if you put any lubrication into that hole i think it's going to have to be something more liquid that's going to flow down and and pass through the races of the bearings and the balls etc or the rollers you know, on a, on a Bridgeport spindle, the bearings are very similar, and you're supposed to grease them. Not so much that they don't overheat, much like Robin Renzetti does in his... It's a really first-class video of him replacing the spindle bearings in his Bridgeport. So, you know, a Bridgeport has an oiler up the top, and the, the spindle nut has the same kind of cup down on the bottom, like a reservoir. And it feels almost a little bit like a total loss oil system in its design you know, like a South Bend lathe or something. When I talk about the, the spindle rebuilding service that I went to later in the video, in, when I first saw him, he mentions that, you know, it really takes very little lubricant to keep bearings going. He's opened up stuff that's decades old, and as long as there's just a little bit of oil getting down in there, they're gonna keep going and going. Okay, this may prove nothing, or may prove something, but um, I've got this collet running pretty dead true. Uh, doesn't have a lot of run out, almost zero run out. It's a three quarter inch collet. That's the, it's the biggest, largest diameter that I've got. This is where the bottom race of the tapered bearing is, and this is where the top race is. When I was trying to test out how it was behaving, the spindle was in the quill. It was more like five thousandths off, and I, I was stunned by that. 
pretty small amount of run out, like less than a, a thousandth. I don't know if the spindle is is straight either, um, in terms of like axially if it's bent. If I'm if I'm spinning the spindle from back here by the hand wheel at the back of it, back of the lathe, then is a lot less run out. So I'm thinking that the spindle is okay. So I did about as much checking as I could with the little V blocks and the little surface plate that I have. Whatever was going on with the run out must have been something to do with the bearings getting knocked out of alignment or the preload being off because I felt like the spindle itself didn't seem bent to me. Uh, I did the best I could to clean up the workspace and make it as like, you know, dust free and contaminant free as I could and then just started putting it back together as carefully as I could. I'm using a small induction cooktop which is actually really handy for heating up the bearings and I have a little, um, you know, infrared thermometer that I'm using to check the temperature. But you can see how easily those races um, they go down onto the shaft on the bearing journal. That's actually an issue that I'll talk about in a minute, but see, even they, even though they're heated up, I don't think they should go on quite that easily. The issue here is that those bearing journals on the shaft, they've worn to the extent that the, the race of the bearing just isn't really seating firmly on the shaft. So there's a slight amount of play which makes for a really suspect foundation because you're kind of building everything on top of that, the, the security of that bearing sitting on the shaft. So you can't really get true precision out of it. This is the little brass plug that goes underneath that um, set screw. You don't want to over tighten that or you'll, you'll actually distort the, um, the lock nut and that will kind of screw everything up. Here you can see that, that that's the spindle nut, that left hand threaded nut there. It has that oil reservoir down at the bottom of it that makes me feel like this whole system is kind of designed more for oil than for grease, but um, <clears throat> the whole thing went together fairly easily. Uh, I heated up the cartridge, the spindle cartridge, the housing, and that made it, um, you know, that made it slip over the outer races of the bearings pretty easily. So I was able to get that run out from about five thousandths down to about a half a thousandths, maybe six tenths, like a little, little more than a half a thousandths. And I feel like most of that improvement has to do with putting those new bearings in and preloading them carefully and just getting the whole thing assembled as cleanly and, and new as I could. And the whole machine is so much smoother and quieter. I think the most of that noise that I was hearing was coming from the bearing that supports the pulley and the bearing at the top of the spindle. I think this machine was actually outside getting rained on for a while. 
and all that debris and water just runs down into that. That's the first place that, that all that junk goes in. So I was fairly happy with that result, but I felt like I wanted it to be even better and I wanted to explore how could we make it better because I knew that the taper inside the spindle was pretty chowdered up from years of abuse. So I started calling around the LA area for people that could do a spindle, do that internal grind of the taper, like regrind it. And there's really not a lot of people left. There's less machine shops, I'll say, in LA than there used to be by a lot. And the machine shops that are in the LA area have all moved to either Orange County or um, into the Chatsworth area because it's a lot cheaper to operate there. But um, no one was returning my calls except for this one guy, Ed Zitney, of MZI Precision down in Huntington Beach. He said he could do an internal grind of the, the BS9 taper inside that spindle there, that mating surface, and clean that up. But with the bearing journals, you know, when the bearings just slip off, when he took it apart, they just kind of slid right off. He said that's because those journals are so worn over the decades that they're just not seating that inner race of the bearing well enough. And you can, you can dial it in as close as you want, but you're never quite going to achieve the accuracy that you're chasing after because the bearings just aren't stable and secure on the journals that are there to support them on the shaft. His suggestion was to take those areas that had been worn and build them back up by chrome plating them with a very hard chrome surface, and then precision grind those journals down to the spec diameter so that they hold those bearings properly. Then you assemble the entire thing, you know, with the tapered roller bearings and the preload nut. Then you internally grind the taper. Uh, you know, the receiving part of the spindle for the tool. And then you're on a much stronger foundation um, in terms of getting to the accuracy that you want, which is about three tenths, I think is kind of the where you want to be for a brand new milling machine, which is the kind of accuracy that I was hoping to get. Um, and that was pretty expensive. I think the cost of that started to approach the initial cost of the entire mill. Um, but I don't see myself getting rid of this machine anytime soon. It's kind of the perfect size for my shop, and um, I don't know, where am I gonna find a better millwright than the one that I have now? I don't think it's, I don't think I can find that. So um, I'm pretty happy with the results.